morning, everybody. We're going to get started with our service, so we're going to invite you guys to take your seat again. Use your teacher. Test, test, one. Test, test, one, two. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're going to get started. We're going to invite you to take your seats. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kirsten Vandermel, and I grew up here at Chapel Grace and in Kalinga, and now I'm a uh, Chapel Grace missionary down in Mexico. So I'm going to take just a couple minutes to give you a little bit of an update of what's uh, going on in my life and down there at Agua Viva. Uh, to, so to start out, for those of you who are not familiar with Agua Viva, we are a ministry just outside of Ensenada, about two hours south of San Diego. Um, our mission is to reach Mexico for Christ, which is a really big and kind of vague statement, but we do that in three ways. One of those ways is through a seminary for Mexican nationals that we uh, bring in people to train them to either uh, pastor, be missionaries, or even just to be lay leaders and volunteers in their local church. Um, so that's one way. Another way is that we rent out our facilities to local churches and organizations to use for events, for retreats, camps, conferences. Um, so think of Hume Lake or Sugar Pine. We are that for northern, northwestern Mexico. Um, and that is a really fun part for me, by the way, because camp was such a huge part of my life. And so to be able to be a part of another place that does that uh, for another community is really great. Um, and then third is missions, and that is uh, two different kinds of missions. One is long-term missions, which we support local Mexicans who are going into unreached people groups of Mexico, and we support them as missionaries. And then a second kind of missions is short-term missions, which is my department. Um, I arrived at Agua Viva about five years ago as a group coordinator, which meant that I oversaw specific uh, American and Canadian groups who came down to do missions trips. And now, for the last three years, I've been overseeing the whole department. So uh, that's been fun for me, especially this last year, just continually, continually learning more about how to do missions well, learning the community and what the needs of the community are, and how we can better serve with the Mexican church. Um, personally, I'm in grad school right now. I'm going to a seminary online to get my master's in intercultural studies. And every class has been great because I get to use that in my context. So I've been able to learn more even just about my own job through that schooling. And I'll be done in May, and I'm really excited um, to, yeah, thank you. I'm excited to, A, have a little bit more time <laughs> in my schedule. Uh, but also just to be able to use what I've been learning for Agua Viva, for uh, missions, um, and that's been really, really fun. So um, I have some stuff out on the back, on the table in the foyer. So after the service, if you want to come and talk to me, if you have any questions, if you want to sign up for my newsletter, uh, you can come and talk to me. I also have some information for an event that we have in the summer called Embrace. Embrace is a uh, kind of halfway between a missions trip and a camp. It's open to all ages. You don't have to come with a group. You can just come as an individual or as a family because like I said, it's all ages. Um, and we place you, you can choose what ministries you wanna do. We'll place you in a team, uh, not only with other Americans, but with other Mexicans as well. And you get to go out into the community and serve and do a missions trip um, like I said, as a family or with your friends, um, or if you're brave by yourself, because um, you'll make friends when you're there. And we have worship at night, we have speakers, everything is translated. Um, it has a special place in my heart. It is my favorite week of the whole, of the whole year. Um, so we have actually two dates this year. One is in July, it's going to be the second week of July, and then the first week of August is another option. Um, so I have some information in the back, so if you're at all interested, just come and talk to me and I can give you a little flyer for it. And lastly, uh, my coworker and friend and I have started a business called, well, I use the term business very loosely. <laughs> um, 
It's an online store. We're just now getting started, but it's called Papel Picado, and we sell, right now we're selling jewelry from the Huichol tribe in Mexico. Um, I have a little bit with me. I have more options that I could send to you if you're interested. And also you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and we hope to keep um, selling different things from different tribes. So um, again, if you're interested, come and talk to me. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for your support, both financial and prayer support. It means so much to me. Um, and I love you guys very much. I am excited to be here and to hang out with you guys. So thank you. Awesome. Memorize this verse. It says eternal life is knowing the one true God and the one whom he sent. It's that simple. Salvation, eternal life, is through knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ. That's it. So if you know him more clearly, more truly this morning, life will flow more freely from you. So let's pray that this morning, God, that, that we would know you more deeply. We real, realize salvation is in, in our efforts to try to pray and try to come to church and try to read our Bible. It's in a, a heart that loves you, cherishes you, thirsts for you, longs for you, is satisfied only in you. And so Lord, I pray as Bruce brings the message this morning that your word would quench the thirst of our soul. May we hear from your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I trust you had a great Christmas day, morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you did it. Christmas Eve, Christmas after, Christmas two days. Doesn't matter as long as you were with family, I think, or with those you love. And maybe you didn't get to be with any of them, but you still had them in your heart. So uh, I got to have all of my kids with me this time. So it was pretty cool. That's been a while since we've all been together. And uh, I don't know about you, but it was, if you ever get to have that, I know some of us don't get to see our kids all the time very often, and it's really nice when you get to see them all together, but it really blows my mind when I look at them, and guess what? They're all grown up, man. They're all individuals. They're all their own people. They're not that little kid. However, if you're a mom or a dad or a grandparent, they're always going to look like that little kid to you. They're always going to be that little, little child that you love and, and, and care for. And uh, so cool that when we finished last week, the, the, the gift of adoption, God will always look at you that way. He will always look at you as his kid, that, that child that, you lo that he loves and watches grow up. How cool is that? And so uh, today we're going to be talking about what kind of church will we be. We're talking going in the future. I know it's not the first today or the 31st, which is tamale. Get that? Tomorrow. But uh, some of you are going to have tamales tomorrow. Um, but uh, I think it's important that we talk about the future of the church and that what kind of church will we be? You know, not, like, not what kind of church we are now, because I think we have a, form, a pretty good grasp, maybe, but where are we heading? And uh, so it's going to be a series that's going to go through the, the, this through today and through the month of next, through next month, uh, all the way hopefully to the end, talking about what kind of church will we be. Now, you understand when I use the term church, I'm talking about us, people. I'm not talking about this building, you know, although it's pretty phenomenal if you look around. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. Well, actually, God is awesome. This is just a great building that he lets us use. But if you look around and you see what God has gifted us with, can you look around your own, your own life and see what God has gifted you with? Because you're the church. You may not have this huge, humongous house you may not have, or you might have a humongous house. You may not have a humongous, well, I guess humongous cars aren't the thing in nowadays, are they? especially with gas prices in California. Maybe you have the smallest car with the best gas mileage. Woo! People like Kelly and Larkin and, and Beverly are going, no. They need the leg room. For me, it's perfect. S but what kind of church will we be? Are we having problems getting it up there, Axiel? Maybe so, kind of. It might be, ha our computer is having a little bit of trouble lately, isn't it? So I think it might be time to start investing in a new computer one of these days. Lori, you can always buy that for us if you'd like. <clears throat> Thank you. It's only about $6,000, so that's fine. Um, I don't know if it's that much, but I'll take $6,000. I'll buy us two. Where are we today? What are we doing? 
And that's not a rhetorical question. Well, it is a rhetorical question because I don't want you to answer back yet. But what are we doing? And, and, and what are we doing not just here? What are we doing there? Because the church doesn't exist just in this space. We exist out there. And so when people see us, do they see the church, really? The church that, that Jesus prayed for in John, chapter, I think it was 17, when he prayed for all believers, and he prayed for us to be one as he and the Father are one. How, how, how important is that? And, and are we that church? Not just this local congregation of believers here at Chapel Grace, but are we that church out there with others that are from other congregations, but still the church? And that's not so much what today is going to be about. It, it's going to flow into it. But what kind of church will we be is important to me. And I know it sounds weird and crazy, and I probably preached this a million times, maybe in not these terms, but I started thinking, where would be the best place to go? Well, I can tell you the first place I need to go, and that's going to be in prayer, because I totally feel the Holy Spirit this morning. I felt him last night as I went to bed. I've watched a, a movie that I shouldn't have before I went to bed, so I had to do a lot of praying, reread my title and my message and my everything else, and God just spoke to me in dreams all night long about this message. And then I woke up like, whoa, that's what i got to say. So hold on. So let's pray. Let's let the Spirit of God guide us. And let's let he, he be the personality, not me. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you. Uh, you woke me up this morning. I opened my eyes and I looked over and saw my beautiful wife and I wasn't with you yet. So you have mission for me still, God. You gave me more breath in this world. Same for all of us. And every day is a gift from you, God. May I use that gift the way you intended. Father, as we worship you today through the, mess the rest of the message and as we did through the song, would our hearts be in tune with your spirit? Father, I pray that your spirit would just wash over the entire place, empty everything negative in this place, empty me of myself, fill me with you, God, Use me the way you want. And may the words that come out be straight from your spirit, God. May they talk to the hearts of everyone here. And I pray for all of those who are out there that couldn't be here today. Maybe they're traveling. It is the holidays. We get that, Father. So keep them all safe. Bring them back to us safely, Father. But we also pray for all those in our church who are sick, and thank you for, for those who are getting better and have some healing to do. We thank you that Bo went through the surgery just well, and he's here today. Thank you for that, God. That's a blessing. Pray that you would continue to heal his body. We pray for Sandy as she continues to heal from cancer, God, and uh, Lord, that she's gotten through the treatments, but she still has a long way to go. Father, get her body strengthened. And Lord, we also pray for, for John Apple and so many others, God, and we just pray that uh, that you would continue to, to be with each and every one of us here, God. Those of us who have fallen sick from whatever illness has been going around to. But God, I don't just pray to you for illnesses. I don't just pray to you for things. I pray to you, God, just to give us the power to live for you. We have it already. May we tap into it. Pray for this message again, God. Because it's through your son, Jesus, precious and holy and healing name, I can only pray this, and everybody says heard somebody say, and everyone who agrees with me, and everyone who agrees with God, that or something, but you might not agree with anything I said. You better, though. That wasn't a threat. So what kind of church will we be? What kind of church? Say again? The one God wants. And he spells that out pretty clearly in his word, doesn't he? He tells us what kind of church will we be. I was starting to speak a little bit about uh, grace last, last uh, Christmas Eve, and sometimes we as a church really don't get it. We don't show that grace like we should. Just great. Print it on the front and back. So what kind of church will we be? A church that knows its origin, which means beginning, in case you didn't know that, uh, which, is, which came from and where, where it came from and where it's going. Why do we exist as a church? Now, that might sound a little bit churchy, but it's not intended to be, because if you don't know where you've been, you're going to make those mistakes, right, over and over and over again. We've got to know where we've been. Actually, we need to know where we came from originally. 
Where'd the church start from? I think all of you already know. I could probably ask you, and everybody should say one word, one person's name. And who is it? Jesus. But I'd like you to open your Bibles up. Let me make sure I'm on that one there. To Matthew. I meant to put black behind that and white lettering, so hopefully you can see that. Can, if you can't see it, you have Bibles right in front of you. you should have, if you brought a Bible with you, if you have it on your phone, open it up to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, this is the one that I could only think about. There's so many places I could have gone to in the, in the Scripture, but this fills... I don't know, God led me right to it. Led me right to it. It's a great one because it's, a, it's, you know, this is probably one of the biggest sections of the Bible that is misinterpreted to. Did you know that? Because this is where some other churches have sprung off and, said, and, and gone and worshipped someone else other than Jesus inside of these texts. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Because doctrine, whether you believe it or not, is important. Truth is important. So is grace. The two can't exist apart from one another. So, oh, he made it big. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, or Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys, of the, the keys to the, of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be, will be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> this is a strange ending to it. Then he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now this is the new NIV, the newer, newer version, I guess you could say. And some words are a little different, but not, this doesn't change anything at all. Because I want to say, then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. I think that's just as important. Messiah, Christ are interchangeable. That's probably why they put Messiah on there. But he ends it with, don't tell anybody. It's kind of opposite of what we say today, isn't it? We'll get back to that in just a minute. But what kind of church will we be? And some of the answers I put on here, this is just... I just did. Can you make it go for me, please? Thank you. Sometimes I can get this thing to work beautifully. Other times I just can't. He asked at the outset, he asked two basic questions, which is something I think are important and, and kind of weigh on the whole context of the whole thing. He says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Which was one of his favorite terms to use about himself. Son of Man. He called himself that, I, I think I read somewhere over 80 times. The Son of Man. It was one of his favorite titles about himself, to call himself, and it's what he used the most. And he says, and he also asked, who do you say that I am? And so those two questions are are probably the most important thing that we need to ask ourselves as we go out into this world. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And clearly Jesus is referring to himself. So you could even take that out and say, who do people say Jesus is? And that's important. And then we could say, who do we? Who do we say he is? Can you tell somebody that? Rather than just going, Jesus? That's like the favorite answer in in Sunday school, right, Mary? You ask a question, everybody's like, Jesus, God. And they're almost always going to get it right, aren't they? Uh, Unless you're talking about somebody else. You're like, no, not quite what we're asking. That's uh, from children's Bible stories, or children's church or something like, Jesus, God, who do you say that I am? You see, because he's the origin of everything. Not just of the church. He's the origin of everything you see here. Don't believe me? You can find it in the beginning of John chapter 1. He said the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word is God. 
Nothing was made without him. Nothing. That's Jesus. Jesus has always been. Because he's God. Now that kind of trips some people up and they don't get it. And I'm going to be honest with you. Can I clearly spell out the Trinity? Because we have God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. We've tried how many times? We've tried to use the analogy of ice. Have you tried that, Miss, Miss Lori? Ice? Okay, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's water, it's mist, it's, or it's vapor, and it's solid in all different forms. And it still kind of falls apart because... It, it just doesn't describe God well enough. Because here's the kicker. Is vapor water at the same time? It's, it's vapor. It's vaporized water. And ice is sol solid water, but, and water's water. But God is God, and God exists at all places at all times. Water's not everywhere all at once. Thank goodness we would be swimming, which some of you might like. If you like to swim, but it's too cold to swim right now. Can you switch it for me, please? I don't know. Red or green? Dag nabbit. Still not working. Just switch it. All right. Who do you say that I am? I want you to kind of understand something here for just a minute uh, in the context of understanding who do you say that I am. I didn't, I could have did these fancy, fancy flip-ins and all those stuff, but I kind of like you guys to see what I'm going to right away. Understand the context of where Jesus is right now, what, what just happened previous to this. He had just got done talking, uh, being challenged, first of all, by the Pharisees and Sadducees, who many of you may understand were the religious leaders of the day. And I've said that, how many times have I said that? Can you count? I don't even know. But they were the people that would be preaching the word of God, I guess, and, and, and leading all of the things in the temple and, and, or in the and synagogues and, and all of those things. And, and so they were the guys that were, most people would look to to find guidance. Make sense? So he goes there, and they had a lot of power. So, he, so he's, he's challenged by them, and they, they asked him some questions, and they wanted to see a miraculous sign. And he said, he says to them, uh, they, they, they asked him, they said, uh, they came to him and tested him and asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Well, he'd already shown how many signs already? Like, so many. So clearly they're blinded to the, to the truth and the reality of who Jesus is. But he replied, when evening comes, you'll say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning today it will be stormy, for the sky is red. This is, right, this is the verses before it in verse 2. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked, adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Now, I don't have time to go into the sign of Jonah because that's a whole other message in itself. But he looked at the point behind it is he talked to them and he said, you know what? You're not going to give anything. You've seen enough. But the more important context comes here when, the fa when, the, when he looks to his followers there, some of the apostles who would be apostles later. He looked at them and he said, when they went across the lake, when they went to the other side, do you remember that message? They went to the other side because... All these people are against him on the one side, so going back to the other side, to where the, who is on the other side? Does anybody remember? The Gentiles. The pigs. The actual pigs. And what the, what the Israelites, and it's a horrible term, considered who, to be pigs as well. Dirty, disgusting people. They went to the other side. They went across the lake, and Jesus said to them, Be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And now, of course, we once again see the ignorance and the, of the people following him who missed everything. Somehow. I don't get it. I, I look at Lori a lot of times when I think about Peter, because she and I have that connection with Peter, but how could they not get it? So he said that, and then they start questioning, oh my gosh, do we not have enough food? Do we not need our bread, Mary? What are we going to do? We're going to starve. We da -da 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 -da. And he looked at him, and, and he perceived what they were talking about, and he said, wait, 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 wait. Are you that dense? This is me talking. Jesus didn't say that, but he probably would have because he wasn't above being pretty direct, right? He was definitely not politically correct. I'll put it to you that way. He said how it was, and that's how we should be. In some places, we'll see. But he said, have you not forgotten the miracles that I just did? I just gave you food. I just, pres I just made all of this bread and fish out of a couple of loaves. A couple of times in front of you, and now you're arguing. He said, you're so dense. You didn't get it. 
I'm not talking about real food. I'm not even talking about that. They clearly didn't even listen to what Jesus said. All they heard was yeast, and they didn't even hear that. They heard bread. And they, and they just got lost in everything that was going on around them. And they, all they thought about was their hunger, their food, and what they needed. And he was trying to tell them, be careful of false doctrine. Stay away from false teachings. Religion gets you nowhere. So he says to them, he says, uh, have you not, don't you remember the five loaves for 5,000? And how many baskets you gathered? How many basketfuls you gathered? And the seven loaves for 4,000? And so on and so forth. And he said, how is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Be on your guard. Why is it important that we know what people are thinking? Why is it important that we know what they're thinking about Jesus, how they view Jesus. Not even just so much the apostles, and the, I mean the, the followers of Jesus right here, but those be, that they were just talking to. The thought process of who they viewed who Jesus was is very important. That's why he asked them. And he made sure they knew. They, and they finally perceived a way he's not talking about bread, he's talking about the yeast, the bad, the, the wrong teaching. They came around. So we'll give him kudos for that. High five. But then he asks them in the next, the next step, who do they say I am? Who do they say the Son of Man is? I replaced it with who do they say I am? Who do they? Who do they say? And can you guys, you guys just watch, read it with me. It's right up there. Who do they say? Some say John the Baptist. He had just recently died. Remember, if you remember reading through your Bible at all right there, he was beheaded. Yeah, only for preaching truth. And exposing darkness, and the, it just didn't work out for the, well, it kind of did for John. John got to be with Jesus, or be with God. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. This is why it's important to know the Old Testament, too. You need to know who these people are. Elijah and Jeremiah were big-time prophets who were actually viewed by many of the day as, like, really bad guys because they kept pronouncing judgment that God would give them, and people got really mad at them. Do you remember that, anybody? Jeremiah was the weeping prophet because he preached prophecy and truth so much. Truth was so important, and he told them, and he was warning them, you guys are messing up, and God's going to do X, Y, and Z. And they got mad at him. Same with Elijah. But some of these people that they forget, and they remember, and they go back, maybe it's going to be Elijah, because it was foretold that Elijah would come back. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But he asked that so he could expose what people thought about him. Who do people say that I am? They thought he was some resurrected, not resurrected, um, reincarnated, thank you. It was right there on the tip of my tongue. Reincarnated person in the form of one of the old prophets. Or even John the Baptist, a recent person. It reminds me, they, they looked at him, and do you know what they all had in common? What they all had in common was they felt like they, those people, when they came, would be able to bring a political agenda back, and the Jews would be on top again. Am I losing you guys? I'm trying not to bore you. This is very important that we set this up. How do we know what people are thinking? It's important that we know what the world thinks. He was trying to make sure that they understood, and they saw how the world thinks. How does our world think about Jesus right now? I want you to think beyond where we are and what we're thinking. Don't even go politics. You might want to go there. But see, politics aren't as important as faith, grace, and truth. What do people say about Jesus today? You know, at one time, it was kosher. I don't even know if that's proper terminology to use. But it was cool to go, hey, Jesus, Jesus, God, Jesus, play, pray, do the pledge. All of this stuff in school. Remember that? I don't remember that because it's never been in my lifetime. Some of you remember that. In the 50s, maybe even earlier, that the Bible was used as a textbook and some of those things, and we forget those things. But why was it used there? Because it was acceptable. We were in a Christian generation. People looked to God for answers. They wanted to hear from God. You could say Jesus' name in school. You could do all of that stuff. Do we live in that day today? Absolutely not. <clears throat> See, here's the deal, though. Why would they if they don't know Jesus? Here's what I'm trying to get at. Who is Jesus to people in the world? I'm going to get at who is Jesus to us in a minute. It's important that we know what the world thinks of Jesus so we know how to reach them. 
so we know how to talk to them. How dare we expect someone who doesn't know Jesus to act like us? How dare we? You see, in the, in the earlier days, I won't even use decades because I don't even remember when it started and when it didn't. It doesn't matter. In the earlier days, it was okay. Now it's not. Why? You, I don't even want to go into the excuses. Who cares? It's the way it is. But what do we do about it? And how do we reach people today? You've heard people say this is a post-Christian nation. It really is. You don't believe me? Just, just watch the news. Listen to people. Go, on, go online for a second. Kalinga is not the same Kalinga. Not even close. So if you're trying to hang on to Kalinga of 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we need to catch up to Kalinga of today. The United States of today. The world of today. So who is Jesus? We know who Jesus is, but what does the world say? Can you got, do you have an answer? Does anybody even know? See, we need to stop looking at who he is in our minds and try and figure out who people think he is what the world says he is. That, I'm not saying that's okay. What I'm saying is we need to understand who he is in the world's eyes. You see, we live in a world that belongs to who? Not Jesus right now. When I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about the place we live in today. Satan. The enemy owns this world right now. I shouldn't say owns, but he, he's been set loose here. Whenever Jesus would talk about the world and the things around us, he talked about the things of the enemy. He talked about the fleshly desires. What world do we live in? We live in a very, pardon me kids, a sexualized culture. I'm not going to say pardon me because all you've got to do is watch Disney for one second today and tell me it's not a sexualized culture. I challenge you. Tell me it's not. You can't. You can't watch a commercial without finding out how our world has changed. We think it's bad in America. Go to other places where they don't censor television. There's straight up nudity on those things. Where do we live? What do we live in? Who, uh, who is occupying this place right now? We should be. So how do we reach these people? You see, the problem is we think it's all us. It's all the events that we do. If we do enough events, we'll reach everybody. If we do enough things, we'll reach everybody. And the problem is, what are we doing with those events? Are they reaching people, or is it just a pat on the back for us to go, Whoa, look how cool we are! Is it being effective? Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it all about Jesus, or is it all about us? And we're so quick to go, it's all about Jesus! Because we say his name every other word in the event that we use. But is it really about Jesus? Is it really about Jesus? Most were looking for a different sort of person than who Jesus was. They were looking for a political king, a guy that was going to come in, the Messiah, who was going to set that world free, and by God, I don't even know what that means. They are going to just, he's going to set them free, and they're going to be on top. Just like I've said, that's the Messiah they were looking for. That's the person they were looking for. That's why when they asked, who are they? They said, one of those different people, but not Jesus, not the Messiah, not the Christ. They didn't recognize him as who he truly was. They were still looking for the right one, and they thought one of these other guys was going to be here first. Guess what? He already came and died. John the Baptist, the announcer for Jesus, had already come, and you missed the boat. So they went to the other side. Boy, I'm getting fired up. Can you tell? Most of people today, <laughs> most people today are, are, too are looking for a different sort of Jesus in this world, including people in this church and around this church, uh, the churches nationwide. They are looking for a different sort of Jesus. They are still looking for a political Jesus to pull them out of the politics of the world. He's not here for that. He's not here to be president of the United States. He's king of the world already. And it's time we started acting like that. Stop worrying about what politics is happening in the world today and worry about Jesus. Amen. Worry about living a life worthy of the kingdom, not of whatever. Most people today are looking for a different sort of Jesus. They really are. And I'm sorry to say it's in the churches, just like I said, too. Music, dress, whatever. And then Satan wins. 
Can you go to the next one? Because I left my thing in my bob up there. Who do you say that I am? Okay, now he's pointing it to us. Who do you say I am? Okay, guys, you say all that, but who do you think I am? And I still want you to get this, because as we read through it, he says, Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter, impetuous Peter, I love him. That's a great word. I learned that a long time ago, but he was just like, ah, spoken, then acted. Or act and then kind of thought, whatever the wording is. You are the Christ, the son of the, see how I highlighted and bolded and everything? The son of the, say that with me. The son of the living God. You're not worshiping a dead thing. I'm not dead. The son of the living God. And what does he say? Blessed are you, Peter. Because God revealed it. Thank you. God revealed it to him. They didn't get it. God revealed it. You see, it's important that we have a true grasp of, grasp of who Jesus is. And the Spirit reveals that. Remember, I want to remind you something. The Spirit had not come upon everybody at this point yet. So he came upon Peter at that moment and said, and Peter revealed who he was. But he's in us today. And so we know who Jesus is. Remember 1 John 4, it says, if we know Jesus, we know God. It reveals the origin of the church. This is where some people d debate about when the church began actually. They debate whether this is the origin of the church or they debate whether it was an ax. I think the power came upon the church in Acts. But I think Jesus exposed where it was going to begin right here because he said, upon that confession, upon what you just said. Now this is where the wrong doctrine comes into play. This passage is so often used to make Peter the leader of the church rather than Jesus. That's the problem. Peter's not the leader of the church forever. He wasn't the first pontus. He's not the bridge builder between man and God. And we know that Peter would become a big leader in the church eventually. Huge. So in that sense, we could say, yeah, Peter was a leader. Maybe he was the first pastor of the church. But he's not the, that's exactly right. But who is he? See, Jesus said, upon this rock. See, Peter's name meant pebble. Do you know that? When he said Petra, it doesn't mean a ginormous boulder or whatever. It means pebble. So a lot of people, like, focus on that. Peter's name is the rock. He's the best. Woo! He's just a little pebble that can be thrown. Now, what do we refer to Jesus as? The cornerstone. You ever seen a cornerstone? They're pretty big. They're pretty heavy. And what starts with this cornerstone start? A building. So what's built on a cornerstone? A building. What's built on Jesus, the cornerstone? You get it? You get it? Jesus is our origin. Jesus is who he, he's the Messiah. He's the one who would come and set us free for real. Amen. You better say amen to that. You better say it louder, Lori. Amen. amen. Because he set us free. So who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Woo, hallelujah. Right? But Peter was like, and then later on, then we see the next, very next thing. What happens right after that? We'll get there. It reveals the origin of the church, the true nature of the church, a church that's reaching out, a church that's built on something bigger than we are. Because I got news for you, not everybody likes us. Some of you guys aren't very likable to other people, including me. But we don't build it on us. Thank the Lord it's not built on me. Woo, you guys, man, Jesus would be ADD if it was built, if he's like me. Good gosh, he's not. But he built us exactly the way we are and with the personalities that we have. I love being me. I don't want to be anybody else. I'm happy most of the time. Unless the Red Sox lose, then I'm not very happy. But they won the world championship, so I got happy, can be happy through the end of next year. But it reveals the true purpose and mission of the church, which is to reach out. And it reveals our true identity. And our true identity is who? Come on. Our true identity is who? It's not us. It's, yeah, God, who is Jesus? Can you flip to the next one? So what Jesus said about himself, oh my gosh, you really can't read that. Don't tell anyone. What? What do you mean 
don't want me to tell anybody. I want you to remember, go back to what people thought about him. Think about the context of where he is. It wasn't time yet for people to know that. And if they knew that he was the Messiah and they started preaching and teaching that truth, he did let that, out, that cat out of the bag in uh, um, the lady at the well in Samaria. You know why that probably was? Would any Jew go to Samaria? You guys remember that story at all? Am I like... No, Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. So Samaria knew about it, that he was the Messiah. Right? But he said, don't. Tell anybody. It's not time yet. I don't want you telling everybody because then it's going to start this whole political thing and all these people are going to rise up because they don't get who I am. Peter didn't get it though. See, he had to talk about his future. He says in the next verse, I'm going to be killed. In verse 21, he says, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be placed before men. I'm kind of going quickly with it. I'll be killed, and on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead, and I'll just say it like it's defeat, death, death, and hell. On the third day. And then what does Peter say? Impetuous Peter, you know, Lori, come on. Yeah, he pulls Jesus aside, as a matter of fact, and he says, hey, come here, Peter, come here. I mean, come here, Jesus. Hey, you're really tall, Jesus. Um, <laughs> go ahead and sit back down. I got my point. Scared her, I think. She's like, what are you doing? And he says, no, this isn't so, G Peter, Jesus. That's not going to happen. Not on my watch. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. He meant, get behind. you can't be on that side of the world. You're either with me or, where did it go? Can you put it back up there? Don't do that to me, Axiel. Peter didn't get it. We have to keep the mind of God, not the world's, not Satan's realm. We have to have the mind of God. We have to be outward thinking, future thinking, because guess what? He's coming back. Yeah, he's coming back. Almost done. I promise, if you're hungry, I'm almost done. We need to keep the mind of God, not Satan's realm. Verse 23 through 26, you can read for it. It's right there. We already read it together. Then Revelation reveals how he's going to come back. And guess what? Guess who's coming with him? Is that a surprise to you? Guess who's coming with him? Can you say it with me? We are. Yeah, just like that. I like that whoever said that. We are. So he says, deny yourselves the things of right now and take up your cross and follow me. Deny your worldly pleasures right now. Follow me. Quit thinking about all the stuff today. Follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's in verse, uh, sorry. You can see it right there. Verse 23 through 26, follow me. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Will find it. You live for Jesus, you find purpose. You find identity. You find truth. Before I get too much further, and I want to make sure I talked about this part, there's, there's the problem that we've come into today is that we get too locked into truth and we forget about the grace. Grace can't exist apart from truth. Truth is true, meaning Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. John 14, 6. Don't break for a second. What are we known for? You see, Jesus is coming back, and we're going to come back with him in verse 27 and 28. The Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what he has done. In other words, you'll be rewarded if you know him or not. In other words, do you belong to him or not? Because he ends it with this, I'll tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Second death. Can you just go to the blank screen for me? Go back to the first, first picture. What kind of church are we going to be known as? Are we known as a church that changed our, our, our name so, we not, so we're not gay? 
Are we known as the church that doesn't dance? Because I sure dance. It's not very good, by the way. And I don't dance in front of anybody, except for Kelly. And I move my finger, like Kyle. What kind of church are we going to be known as? Let me get to this, this point right here. Grace and truth. We need to love everybody, love all people, show them grace, the same grace you were shown by God, but we need to hold the truth. And there's a tension there in the middle between grace and truth. See, here's, here's the killer. We can love people, but not show it. There's a lot of people. I've, I've talked about the bullhorn guy before. You guys ever heard me talk about that guy? The guy who stands on the corners at concerts and, and uh, ball games or whatever else and has the bullhorn, stands on the pulpit thing and yells, you all, everybody's going to hell. Apart from Jesus. That's, uh, is that true? Seriously, I want you to answer me. Is it true without Jesus you're going to where? Do people see grace in that? Who is he speaking to mostly? Non-Christians. Walking to a concert or a baseball game and don't have any mind about what this crazy guy on the corner is screaming. And they only hear two words. You're bad and you're going to hell. Is he speaking truth? Is he showing grace? Here's the difference, though. If God told him to do it, he better do it. So it's not judgment upon that guy. But sometimes we as the church speak truth and show no grace. Absolutely true. We need to hold between the two. We need to love people. But we can't say that's, that activity is completely okay. And here's what's happened in the church today. They hold it. They hold it one or the other too much. All, great, all truth, all grace, which is love, but nothing in the middle. I love everybody. You can be whatever you want to be. And they justify it with scripture. You can be whatever you want to be. And they accept it all. That's not okay. Then there's the other coin, other side of the coin. All truth. Blah, 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 whatever it is. And that's not okay by itself. There needs to be the mixture of the two, grace and truth. So what kind of church will we be? I pray that we're a church that's known that loves Jesus and loves people. And that all people are welcome here, no matter what. This is a hard teaching. And I'm ending it on a hard note. And I'm not judging any one of you. So if you're being judged, if you're feeling conviction, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. So talk to him about it, not me. I want you to know that I've been convicted about this. I've lived my life in such a way that I've like looked at people and judged whether they were a good Christian or not by the outward appearance. And I'm telling you now that's wrong. And if you're honest with yourself, you're that same person. You've done that probably sometime in your life as well. That's not the church we're supposed to be. But we're supposed to love people, show grace, but hold the truth. Preach the truth in love. Let God take care of it. I know that's a hard place, and we're going to unpack that a whole lot more as we go along. But what we need to remember is where did we start? Who are we based on? We've lost our way. We've lost our origin. We've, we've forgotten truly who it is about and how he treated people. Jesus Christ, how did he treat people? Love and grace. The woman at the well, great example. The woman drug out to him in the midst of adultery, who the Pharisees said, stone her. She sinned, and Jesus said, who of you, you without the first, you without sin, throw the first stone. I mixed that up. But you got the point. You without sin, throw the first stone. What did they all do? Because they knew all of them were sinners. They knew it. Guys, I'm not telling you to relive your glory days of sin. What I'm telling you to do is think about what it was like before Jesus. Some of you have that. I don't even want to tell you about my life before Jesus. 
but I want to remember what my life was, and I want to remember how good God is and how much he saved me from that garbage. That's what we can't forget. Remember that when next time you see a person at a street corner preaching uh, about homosexuality or whatever else, transgender, I don't care what it is. Next time you see a gay, gay pride parade, I probably won't be there. But, but if I have a friend that I love, I've got to find a balance there. Should I, hold, should I love them and say, look, I, I, I love you. I don't support what you're doing, but, you know, whatever. And then try and find a way to reach them. I can tell you this. Filling a squirt bottle or squirt gun with urine and spraying the people in the gay pride parade does not show love to any one person. If you do that, shame on you. You're going to answer for that. Likewise, they don't have the right to do anything like that to us. But that's when Jesus said, turn the other cheek and keep at it. Let's pray. Can you get ready, Jared? Well, before we pray, I just want to... This is some heavy stuff. I had a lot more things I wanted to say. But they'll come as the weeks come along. You probably know that I'm thinking about the future and where we're headed. And don't worry, we're not going to be all inclusive and open to every single thing. That's not what this is about. But this is about figuring out the, the, the tension between grace and truth. Who are we? And how do we display that truth of love to everyone around us? How do people view the church today? If you guys can stand with me. How is the church viewed? Not Chapel Grace especially. The church itself. I want you to think about that. How is the church viewed? Is it viewed as a social program to feed people? Or to give them electricity, pay their electricity bills? Or is it viewed as the true light of the world? The vehicle that Jesus chose to reach this world for him. See, that's what we need to remember. This world is to be reached and is to be done in the name of Jesus not in the name of Chapel Grace or any other church but we do exist as Chapel Grace that name means to mean that we love Jesus so where does that leave us? we're going to talk a whole lot more about that in the next four weeks so don't go anywhere and it's not, that's not, it's not, all, it's not all of it folks, how's that go? how does he have you say that? It's, yeah, Daffy's not saying that's all, folks, because it's not all. So if I can get our prayer partners up here, prayer people that want to pray with me in case people want to come forward for prayer, we're not going to tell, or we're not going to stay long. If the Spirit of God is working on you, I don't know what He's doing. I was way excited about this message, and I still am excited about it. And I'm like, Lord, you led me that way, and you led me this way. But it doesn't matter where God, where the Lord led me. Where did He lead you today? What's He saying to your heart? That's what you need to take care of today, right now, this moment. I guarantee you're going to walk out. You'll forget everything I said except for the stupid things, the goofy things. Well, maybe you won't. No, I'm not going to forget. It's proven that you don't remember everything in a message by studies or whatever else. But the main thing is this. Who are we going to be? And what are we going to be known for? Jesus or not? As we sing, I'm going to pray. Uh, what are we going to sing? called running in circles I'm not sure how I feel about it I'm just kidding <laughs> running in circles but I want to pray for us before we sing give you an opportunity if you want to do business with God right there fine you don't have to come up here and pray with anybody you can, now we have a whole side here that's empty if anybody else feels led that they want to come up and pray with people that's fine grab somebody that needs to be praying with if you know somebody that needs prayer grab them and pray with them right there come right up to the I don't know what the steps and pray if you just need to do business, sometimes you know what you need to do and you don't need anybody else telling you. But if you need prayer about anything, you want to become a member, not a member, you want to be baptized, whatever it is. So let's pray. So Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. And Lord, I, I pray that your spirit would have, have uh, I don't know, said and spoke and did the things that it was supposed to do. Lord, you had put other things on my mind and you didn't lead me that way. You'd put other things on paper and you didn't lead me that way. You led me the way you wanted it to be. So, Lord, who are we? Depends on who you are. 
and you're God. You're everything. So that makes us everything if we know your son, Jesus. So God, thank you that I have value, I have worth, I have purpose and all of that. But God, as we head into 2019, Father, may we be the church that you've called us to be. May we not worry about what every other church is doing as far as local body and assemblies. May we worry about what Chapel Grace is doing. May we worry about what we're saying, what we're doing, and how we're teaching, and how we're training, and how we're following you, God. God, me personally, may I fall and yield to you every moment of every day. May I be the first one to do it. May I be the first one to give. May I be the first one to serve. May I be the first one to fall on my face before you, God. May we follow you every second of every day. In Jesus' precious and holy and healing name I pray. And we say, before we go, I need to tell you, next week, we're going to begin a little different of, of a, a meet and greet. It's going to start... Uh, well, really, we'll be ready about 10.30, but you don't need to come till 10.45 when church service starts, if that's when you want to come. But we're going to have coffee and desserts or donuts or whatever we have. And we're going to invite you to come as a family. I'd encourage you to be here. I'd encourage you to be a part of it with us. So we're going to get not just five minutes. We're not just going to get three minutes. We're going to get a whole 15 and maybe 30 if you show up at 10.30. And we're going to start right in here. We're going to come right in here. We'll give you a warning. We'll head right in here and we'll start worship and everything. But our meet and greet is going to be out there so we can hang out. If it's too cold for you, you can hang out right there. Just don't bring food in here. So I want you to know that. You know why we're going to do that? I want you to spend time with each other. How much time do you really spend in here when we say meet and greet? How much time do you actually get to say hi? Very little. So we need time. We need time. Just where God led me. Led us. So as we sing running in circles, maybe you can run in circle right where you are and pray. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Jared. So forgetful but you always remind me You're the only one who brings me You're the only one who brings me peace. So forgetful. So forgetful. But you always remind me. You're the only one who brings me peace. You're the only one who brings me peace. So I come. Lord, I come, I come, Lord, I come, to tell you I love you, to tell you I need you, to tell you there's no better place for me than in your arms, to tell you I'm sorry. Running in circles, placing my focus on the waves, not on your face. You're the only one who brings me peace. You're the only one who brings me peace. I'm so forgetful. Always remind me You're the only one who brings me peace You're the only one who brings me peace So forgetful So forgetful you Always remind me You're the only one who brings me peace You're the only one who brings me peace. So I come, Lord, I come. 
Lord, you're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the only one who can bring us peace. The only one who can bring us peace. God, we're so forgetful. Find ourselves running in circles back in that place where we didn't want to be. Remind us over and over again that you're the only Savior. You're the only source of peace, hope, and life in this world. God, may we not be satisfied with living a life in our own power. You have strong and amazing promises that everything that we need for life and godliness has been given to us. Yet we find ourselves falling short day in, day out, moment after moment. God, help us have a full dependence and reliance on you and on your spirit that we would press in and that we would wait and we would be patient for you to show up and to give us the truth and for the moment. Help us to walk boldly and in the power of your spirit in light of the truth of the gospel and the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday.